Brazil's Supreme Electoral Court has confirmed former President Jair Bolsonaro undermined democracy when he was president. He won't contest elections until 2030. What led to this verdict? Over 1,000 people have been arrested in protests after the police killing of French Algerian teen Nail. Does the French government have any answers? The right-wing U.S. Supreme Court has struck down relief for those with student debt. How will this affect millions? These are our stories today on this episode of Daily Debrief. Former Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro won't contest an election in Brazil for eight years. The country's top electoral court says he undermined democracy when he said the electronic voting system could be hacked. His lawyers say the statements didn't matter because Bolsonaro lost the 2022 election. Bolsonaro returned to Brazil in March after three months in the United States. He sought a political comeback for himself and was repeating many outrageous claims of his election campaign. We'll go to Prashant from People's Dispatch now to ask him what this really means. Prashant, Bolsonaro's lawyers make an interesting argument. They're saying that, well, he lost the election, so it doesn't matter what he said before it. Uh, does well, that make sense? Well, actually, the issue here is basically that he lost the election as well. Then, okay. But he, like, he didn't lose the election uh, in with uh, you know uh, with grace or with propriety is really the point. And it actually had a very violent impact. We know that in January this year, Bolsonaro supporters actually stormed key buildings in Brasilia. Yeah. And why did they storm these key buildings? These, they stormed these key buildings because over many months, a campaign was built up. You know, Bolsonaro uh, himself was at the forefront of this campaign where he and his supporters basically kept saying that the Brazilian electoral system was uh, liable to being manipulated, it could be hacked, etc., etc. Now, this is despite the fact that multiple, there was a lot of evidence provided it is not possible to hack it that way. You know, multiple authorities had certified it. But Bolsonaro and his supporters kept repeating these claims, creating an overall sensation that uh, the system itself was fraudulent and hence if he was defeated, it was a f false defeat. He was not actually defeated. Right. Right. So uh, that was really the core of the issue here. So it's a very disingenuous argument when Bolsonaro's lawyers say that, uh, you know, he lost the election, so it's fine anyway. <laughs> because that's precisely the point. In fact, if you look at some of our coverage of the People's Dispatch coverage of the Brazilian elections, you'll see that in many of these rallies, there was this underlying sentiment that uh, even if he loses, it's because the electoral system is... Uh, flawed and you know it is broken etc etc so that is what the supreme electoral council judges have taken a very clear stand against and also the fact that you know this goes back to this uh, event in july 2022 i believe when bolsonaro talks to foreign ambassadors and he basically you know gives the impression that this the system is insecure now this happened in a public building it was circulated on public media and right. uh, you know public funds were used so that itself is a massive abuse of power so it's not just about questioning the integrity of the system it's also about abuse of power as well so uh, this is a you know it's a vital moment a very important moment because it brings some amount of accountability to someone who uh, basically uh, que not just questioned the system but actually attacked the system and you know the kind of the way these kind of messages works is that from Bolsonaro it's maybe a, a just one statement some hints some insinuations and then it kind of gets amplified by the time it gets right. to the base you have rock certain belief among a section of people that uh, the electoral system is completely flawed and this ca calls into question the very uh, possibility of democracy itself when you have a substantial section of people who are convinced that the electoral system is flawed all based on a campaign of lies and a very cynical campaign of lies. So right. that's really what because it's the same system under which he came to power in 2018. So he exactly. won the election, right? So. Uh, so keeping all of this in mind, I think that it's not surprising that uh, the verdict has been, it's a 5-2 verdict. Even those, the two judges who voted uh, against disqualifying Bolsonaro said that he had the freedom of expression. So they justified it using freedom of expression. But the other judges have pointed out that freedom of expression does not mean the freedom to lie. And they've said it very explicitly, right? <laughs> Just because you have the freedom of expression, it doesn't mean that you can blatantly and outrightly lie. And that, I think, is really the core of the issue. So he's been disqualified uh, from contesting in any election till 2030. And it's 2008 years because it, the date is back to, I believe, October 2022 or right. something. So right. that's why it's 2030. So uh, a very, I think, uh, a, a very good judgment, a very essential judgment, because quite often, uh, you know, leaders, uh, especially people who have been in positions of uh, power and some of the highest positions of power in many of these countries go scot-free 
after making statements like this which affect the very, which systemically affect uh, and I think that's a very important thing here. We should not see this just as an individual statement, but as something that had a systemic effect on Brazilian democracy itself. And I think that it is a recognition of that, that the Supreme Electoral Council has chosen to take action on these comments, which could, you know, I mean, otherwise have been dismissed as, okay, it's just part of a campaign. Plan. Right, right. So I think that's, uh, so that way it is a very significant judgment. Right, Prashant, but also it's not just a statement he made here or there, which is actually the issue that a host of battery of charges which he faces, what are those about? Right, so Bolsonaro, of course, facing a variety of charges, I think over a dozen, if I'm not mistaken, kind of similar to Donald Trump also. Right. And it's, uh, again, interesting that uh, he has been, this is the first case he has been, uh, you know, officially he faces action, just as Trump is facing action on the leak documents case, which is really the least of his crimes. Right. So too for Bolsonaro, I wouldn't say this is the least of his crimes, but there are also so many other uh, charges. For instance, the uh, the proceedings related to the January attack uh, in Brasilia have not really concluded yet. He is very much, you know, he should be in the dock for that. It's unclear I mean, I, what, how, that pro how long that process will take. There is, of course, his handling of COVID-19. I don't know if that will ever be brought to justice. There have been cases against him for the, the way he sort of, uh, you know, uh, his policies have affected the indig indigenous community as well, the question of the Amazon forest. So Bolsonaro's years as president were among the most disastrous in the country's history. And some of it might come, you know, some of it might lead to legal action, but a lot of it will be just, uh, will, is likely to be taken as part of a president's policy framework and he'll never face action. And I think this was, again, the question we talked about when it came to Trump as well, that, you know, the fact, of course, is that Trump is never going to face uh, legal action for what he's done to Cuba or what he's done to Venezuela. Right. Similarly for Bolsonaro, whether, you know, whether he'll ever be held accountable for what happened during COVID-19, the disastrous policies followed by Brazil during COVID-19, it's really a very big question. So I think keeping all this in mind, uh, sort of, uh, you know, important to mark uh, this uh, verdict. Uh, it'll be, of course, this throw, throws the field open for other right-wing challengers who have a similar platform. The problem with people like Bolsonaro also is that it's not just one person. It's also, there is a, you know, there is a certain acceptability that a kind of pol uh, that a particular kind of polit writing politics gets when someone like Bolsonaro becomes president and this spawns an entire generation of politicians who follow that model as well. Right. So there will definitely be more uh, in this uh, in this trajectory of politicians who follow this kind of message, who uh, follow these kind of principles. Some of them may not be as crude as Bolsonaro and may not make such uh, stupid mistakes. Or, you know, of you know, but and but will still remain very dangerous. So, still challenges galore. So, just because Bolsonaro has been temporarily, and of course, he's going to appeal this verdict. So, we don't know. That's yet. right. Yeah. But assuming that he gets disqualified for eight years, it's not that the challenge from the far right is over in Brazil. Right, Prashant. And you know what? We'll be back with you in just another couple of minutes. We go to France, where the situation has only escalated over the past few days. Protests have broken out in many parts of the country and even in overseas territories. Many of the protests have led to violence as well. People on the streets are condemning systemic racism. Blacks and Arabs were also the majority of victims in recent police killings. But France is also far from acknowledging this problem. Let's go back to Prashant. Prashant, is it really possible to look at this case of the French Algerian boy getting killed by police without looking at the history of France and Algeria? And not just Algeria, I think French colonialism uh, and uh, the policies of France as a whole. Because, see, uh, I think there have been a number of reports in recent times which have documented, for instance, that uh, people coming from, uh, uh, people from African or without African origins or Arab origins are more likely to be stopped at traffic uh, right. stops in France. And we know that, uh, just to, of course, explain the case once again, what happened was this 17-year-old uh, boy was stopped, a delivery driver was stopped at a traffic stop by the police was deemed a threat by the officer who, uh, you know, shot him point blank. And of course, then the police first tried to claim that he was, uh, you know, somehow it was his fault. Right. But then the video came out and then basically that completely demolished those claims and kind of similar again to George Floyd and that moment in the United States as well for viewers to remember. But uh, like you said, it's impossible to sort of see this without uh, the, both the incident itself and the protests that followed without looking at France's history of colonialism and racism. The fact that even now people, uh, you, know, you know, people of African or Arab origin 
uh, are discriminated against in a variety of ways, not just in terms of the legal system or the police system where you see these kind of incidents happening a lot, but also in terms of the larger approach, social approach of the state in terms of social indicators. And there is a wide sense of marginalization that people of these communities feel. And it is this that uh, leads to these kind of spontaneous outbursts of protest that we see when an incident like this takes place. An incident like this is significant because it rips the bandage of, uh, you know, it, 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 it's no holds barred after that. And there's there's yeah. nothing really that anybody can say in justification. Of course, some right-wing sections have tried to sort of say that, keep pushing the narrative that it's the boy's fault, you know, he was not raised properly for whatever, etc., etc. And, uh, but uh, overwhelmingly the mass protests uh, and also the very unstructured nature of those mass protests, it's not that, uh, and there's been, like you said, there's been a lot of uh, violence and looting as well. It's just this outburst of anger against a state which has withdrawn in so many ways from the lives of people, but has reiterated, but has strengthened the approach, the, its militari militarized approach to people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on the one hand, of course, you have uh, a complete withdrawal, a failure to address the aspirations of people. On the other hand, you have a violence gaining more and more prevalence. And I think that is what people are so upset about, people are so angry about, and hence you see this outburst of anger. Also important to note that uh, in the past, uh, say, what do you call, I think uh, over the past, in 2017, there was a law passed which enabled, which uh, expanded the scope of the police in terms of using violence at such places. Yes. And that has really helped, you know, that has contributed to these incidents as well. So keeping all of this in mind, uh, I think no surprise at all. And uh, these are often mentioned time and again. It's not a surprise at all. Like I think there's a similar sort of round of incidents, I believe in 2005, when a, when a teen was also uh, killed this way. And across the world, in many parts of the global north, we see this time and again. Uh, people from um, uh, people from uh, Africa, people from African orig African origins, people from uh, Arab origins, people from Hispanic origins, all of them facing structural violence uh, and uh, structural uh, and many of them losing their lives in the process and which is followed by and of course then the, those in power make all these statements about oh it's unfortunate, oh this is uh, regrettable right. while talking about those single incidents but refusing to address the larger reasons for the crisis that are there. Right, Prashan, that's exactly what many of the protesters actually have been saying, that, you know, you're looking at the incident, but you're not accepting the fact that there's a systemic problem here. Let's look at the response of the French state to the protests themselves right now. What, what has that been like? So, like, again, in, in continuation of that trend, the police, res the French state's response has just been to send large number of police. So, I think the latest numbers say that 45,000 uh, police personnel have been deployed. And you know, hundreds of people have been arrested across the across the country. Uh, the you know, Macron has uh, he has made some faux pas. He was seen attending an Elton John concert right. on Wednesday, for instance. Right. Uh, you know, then he's made the usual appeals, uh, saying it's unfortunate, calling for unity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, whatever. But this is definitely a moment of uh, crisis for this government. But also, I would think <clears throat> any government in the global north which faces such a moment, because uh, moments like this throw into sharp uh, uh, you know, sharp focus, the, like I said, the kind of structural reasons for this. And then at that point, the politicians, those in power, don't have any answers except these very anodyne words of sympathy and comfort and, you know, good, goodwill and all that kind of stuff. Because confronting these issues requires a very honest reckoning with uh, your present, your past, which would really shake the structure of the state. So uh, you won't find <clears throat> governments, uh, you know, doing that. So I think uh, the French government is doing the only thing uh, it, the system allows it to do at this point, which is send thousands of police people and try to sort of wait out the protests uh, as much as possible. We are recording on Saturday. The burial of uh, Nile is supposed to take place on Saturday. I don't think it's happened yet as we record. But whether this could lead to more protests, very big question. And even if the protests, you know, kind of come down in a few days, I think there is a larger question for France because we have seen a variety of sections being unhappy with, you know. Yes. Uh, the, so we have seen months of protests by workers over pension reforms. Some years ago, we saw the Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow West protests. So uh, France is definitely in a, in a major turmoil and with and led by a government which is in complete denial and which sort of tries to, you know, uh, Emmanuel Macron far more focused on supplying arms to Ukraine 
rather than uh, you know addressing many of these issues. So I think uh, for, normally you would, uh, I suppose the media would say this is a wake up call for <laughs> whatever government is in power. But I don't think these governments are sleeping. They're close. Their eyes are closed deliberately. So you know, wake up calls work for those who are asleep, not for those who. Uh, deliberately choose to close their eyes to the problem and I think the Macron government is definitely one of them. Right Prashant and obviously like the action is speaking much louder than the words right now. Thanks a lot for joining us. And finally we return to the US Supreme Court which has taken another anti-people decision. It struck down the 400 billion dollar student debt relief plan introduced by President Joe Biden. In a decision taken along clear ideological lines, the conservative supermajority in the Supreme Court said that the president overstepped his authority by introducing this plan. The ruling favored the six Republican states that had challenged this plan. Now the over 43 million citizens who could have benefited from the plan face uncertainty. We'll go over to Anish from People's Dispatch to ask him what this really means. Anish, could you take us through the debt relief plan? What was in it and why did the Supreme Court strike it down? It sounded like a great thing to do. Well, the plan itself was not a matter to be charged with the Supreme Court as per the Supreme Court's own decision, at least the majority decision. Uh, it was not whether or not the plan was good or not. It was whether the executive had the authority to decide uh, whether an existing law can be interpreted in a manner that uh, can give sweeping uh, debt forgiveness for uh, billions of students. Now, the issue is that obviously a lot of uh, this was something that was foreseen by a lot of progressives within the Democratic Party as well, uh, uh, because the HEROES Act, which was at the center of contention, which was used as uh, you know, as a means to extend this uh, uh, debt forgiveness plan of four hundred billion dollars, uh, was actually uh, actually stipulated more or less clear conditions, uh, which was which included national emergencies of different sort, war, famine, and stuff like that. So uh, it was under these circumstances that you can actually uh, ex uh, you know extend uh, uh, debt forgiveness for uh, educational loans. Uh, for students who have uh, suffered under such national emergencies. Now, the issue was that how do you interpret that? Is That was a big question. And uh, the White House at the time uh, in August last year uh, decided that it could be interpreted as a fact that there is an ongoing pandemic and the pandemic is a very valid condition for to offer and extend student forgiveness. And this was actually used uh, not necessarily as a very legally sound means, but uh, an effective means to uh, address the growing uh, student debt crisis in the country, which is which stands at about $1.7 trillion. So about $400 billion uh, uh, to be spent uh, in the next 30 years was not a major deal, but the effectiveness of it was uh, at the heart of the question for the White House. But obviously, the Supreme Court decided because of its conservative majority, a super majority, six to three, that is how the right. whole vote was divided. Uh, they decided that uh, the White House did not have the authority to interpret uh, the law in such a manner. Now, the issue definitely comes uh, big, uh, uh, comes down to how to extend the existing student loan uh, forgiveness that the White House and the Democrats do seem to be very keen on extending at this point. So uh, that is uh, that is once uh, one part apart from the existing uh, dial not dialogue but the kind of discourse that exists among the right wing and definitely the Republicans who try to deem it as an unfairness question that there are, there is in fact that majority of Americans uh, U.S. citizens do not uh, take any kind of student loans. Uh, but primarily because they can't afford to uh, go to uh, universities or colleges uh, because the cost of higher education is exorbitantly high. It is actually much higher than even the medium income of an average American household in many ways. And so for them, uh, it, is not, it is not possible to pay or you know, even uh, imagine thing, uh, taking uh, loans that high that they would have to pay for the next maybe decades of their lives, uh, 10, 20 years of their lives. So this is something that is one of the reasons why, but the Republicans do not address that. They make it seem as if that hardworking Americans are being fleeced off uh, by uh, the elites. Uh, oh. The elites in question is obviously 
uh, uh, most of them, uh, most of them who have been deemed as eligible under the loan waiver plan are basically uh, working class children, uh, children whose parents were, are working class, who come from working class families, who had to take loans so that they could, uh, you know, uh, pursue higher education, again, uh, for higher social mobility. So these are questions that never get addressed in such uh, debates and discourses at the moment. But definitely this this is a, def a big setback for about uh, millions of Americans who were looking forward to this plan, considering the kind of applications, the number of applications that already came through after the loan waiver was uh, announced. Okay, Anish. Now, tell me about how this is going to actually affect those 43 million people who probably were awaiting this waiver to come through, right? Yeah, so it is quite difficult to say because at, the, at this moment, the Democrats are not uh, what we see from the kind of statements that we see from even establishment Democrats. They, are, they do not want to back out of the plan. So they will be, uh, already the White House has released a statement that they will be using the Higher Education Act of 1965 to address the, the Higher Education Act of 1965, for those who do not know, was introduced in the U.S. as a sort of, uh, uh, you know, extending uh, cheaper loans to students who cannot afford uh, higher education, especially in fields like science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So it was uh, a means to actually expand, uh, out, uh, you know, the coverage of higher education among students. And uh, obviously it has been used in the past several times, but never in the scale that the Biden administration currently wants to pursue, which is like $400 billion at, uh, at the current flag that they have. Uh, the last time they used it was in 2021, uh, which had a $6 billion debt forgiveness plan for students who were fleeced by the universities, many of them private. So uh, that is what the Biden administration wants to pursue. This was also something that was uh, earlier addressed by some of the progressive elements within the Democrats, especially in the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, but uh, we need to see how that is going to uh, go forward because there will definitely be, again, uh, uh, challenges, legal challenges uh, against such acts. Uh, again, the similar kind of arguments can be used like the manner in which that you, uh, the executive cannot, which is what the Supreme Court judged, right? That the education, uh, that, that the executive cannot uh, uh, interpret or reinterpret uh, existing legislation. So the Higher Education Act is also an existing le legislation that will be used for such sweeping uh, forgiveness plan. So we need to really see how that is going to work. On the other hand, the moment for uh, not just uh, debt forgiveness, but also cheaper education is quite booming at the moment because obviously pandemic has hit everybody and it is going to, it, uh, and working class movements are already mobilizing a lot of these lines, calling for a significant debt relief program. And at the same time, also addressing the very exorbitant cost of education in the country at the moment. Anisha, thanks a lot for joining us with that. And that's all we have for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We'll see you again on Monday. Our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts have more of our stories. And our YouTube channel has more updates. And this show, Daily Debrief, thanks again for watching.